Welcome back to guys. I'm I'm really sorry about the knock. It won't happen again. Unfortunately, Arsenal can't win the league by being handsome and having aura. But to be clear, we would win the league if that was the metric. We will have to actually play football in 24-25. But looking at the team now, something's hit me in the last few days and it's made me really excited for this season. I think Arsenal now have one of the most versatile, diverse, high quality and intelligent set of build-up profiles in world football. The group we've assembled of goalkeepers, defenders and the few midfielders who are usually tasked with starting our play off, either from deep settled play, from a goal kick or any other kind of reset back with the aim to get us to the final third, is genuinely amazing. And why is this so exciting for the non-football nerds? We'll come to that. Let's first be clear what we mean by build-up. You can call it the first phase, ball progression, moving through the thirds, whatever. But I see it as one of the key overall kind of existential questions for a coach. How do you ask your team to move the ball up the pitch to score a goal? How are you set up to get to the final third? Mikel has always been a master of getting Arsenal forward and breaking through teams in different ways over the years, breaking through so many barriers and blocks along the way. And now the tools he has at his disposal for that job have never been better. Sometimes on these types of videos, people comment, stop giving away our tactics, as if Pep's watching TDK at home in his underwear going, yeah, 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 make this guy the coach. Yeah, 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 more than you believe. But because we have such variety in our potential structure, as I'll hopefully show, it means, in my opinion, that Arsenal are going to be incredibly unpredictable next season. How will any opposition know with certainty what structure we're going for on the day? But that's, for me, half the fun and the excitement. What we don't know, what we're about to discover. So with that out of the way, let's jump into it and first discuss how we got here. When Arsenal played Bayern Munich away in the UCL quarterfinal, we were all frustrated by our seeming inability to get going. The man marking inside played havoc with our ball progression and our right-hand side was totally shut down by Guerrero, Masraoui, Musiala and Lima. They did this by actually doing a bit of an Arsenal trick. They slanted their press to the left. Combine that with the fact they didn't step on very much, it meant we had the ball a lot of the time, especially in the early stages, with a spare man in our build-up on the left. Gabriel. I think Bayern basically gambled on the idea that Gabriel has a little bit less in his toolkit on the ball than a Saliba, so made him the spare man. And it kind of worked. At times we looked toothless. This is in no way Gabriel slander. I absolutely love the guy, but we all know giving Gabriel your most touches is probably not where you get the absolute best out of his game. In the same way that Saka is unbelievable, but you'd never ask him to be a knock and run type winger. Gabriel had time on the ball in that game, deep, with space to step into and carry, but didn't manage to make the most of it because it's not his biggest strength. We didn't have someone on that side who could capitalise on that at the time. But now, we do. Gabriel completes 0.32 progressive carries per 90, the 22nd percentile in Europe's top five leagues, where Ricardo Calafiori completes 1.07 per 90, the 81st percentile, with a carrying distance of 278.81 yards per 90, which is the 84th percentile. Gabriel has better defensive numbers, but our new Italian is much more comfortable in a more John Stonesy type role, as he said in the past. Imagine Calafiori in the types of situations that Gabriel found himself in in the buying game. Space to step into, time on the ball. He'd kill you. In the same way he did for Bologna and does for Italy, he could step through the midfield, commit defenders, attack the second line in a different way, and we would have been less shackled all over as it freed up other players. This is a tactical weapon that we needed and now have. In fact, I bet the decision to sign Calafiori was made after that game. But it's important to note that Mikel has been doing this for years. We've not arrived with this set of profiles by accident. Calafiori is the latest in a long line of profile acquisitions to fix certain issues and develop the game model. When he signed, Mikel spoke about the skills and qualities Calafiori has that will make us better, and this is a perfect use case. Maybe the difference between a UCL semi-final and not. Millions of pounds on defenders and goalkeepers and so on get sniffed at, but I think it's because some people don't quite understand what we're trying to build. Even early iterations. Pablo Mari gave us an important left-footed option very early on from the back, Gabriel improved on that. Zinchenko facilitated the fullbacks coming inside. Cedric was here. Joking aside, every signing has had its purpose, including Cedric. This is a non-exhaustive skills list, and we're only going to be talking about the in-possession qualities in our first phase for these profiles. But through that process described, we've now arrived at this list. David Raya, a goalkeeper with the press baiting quality to put his foot on the ball and force teams onto us, but also with the two-footed passing quality to find clip balls into the channels, 
go out wide and go long, all at an elite level. William Saliba, a central centre-back with more capacity to step forward than I think he's currently showing, but simply incredible tempo control, a brilliant passing range and the ability to pull wide right or remain narrow. Gabriel, someone comfortable on the left of a three and build-up, developing that fired ball into the middle and across his body to the right, often to Erdegaard in the pocket, and also comfortable splitting wide of a goalkeeper in a three and going very deep to press bait. Ben White, a total unicorn capable on the overlap, inside, out wide, in a three, and although we haven't seen it for a while, central with unique athletic capacity. Then there's Tomiyasu, comfortable across the back line and with some flexibility to go inside on the left, as we saw against Sevilla last year. Zinchenko's unique profile and Kivio, of course, as well. Someone with versatility at left centre-back and left back with scope to show us more in the final third, I feel. And now you've added Calafiori, capable of stepping out from deep, as mentioned. Fluid and comfortable centrally or out wide on the left with some quality and capacity at central centre-back too, which you can see for Italy at times. Alongside a returning Durian Timber, capable across the back four and into the pivot, able to carry and combine from deep with an incredible turning radius and technical level with a lack of angle bias. That's before we mention any of the midfielders like Rice, the arriving Marino, Jorginho, Erdegaard, Partey and so on who can all drop into the pivot and act to support the build-up in different ways, some of whom are even comfortable stepping further back to drop in behind play as an auxiliary third centre-back or nominal central player in build-up. Let's just pause. Do we really, as fans, realise the options we now have? Do we realise ahead of the new season the quality we have in there? Not only to set up that way between different games, but also changing within games. I can't think of a more complete set of profiles other than at Man City, although how much a complete set of profiles is a virtue could be argued, considering some of that is down to the variety with which Arteta and Pep type coaches like to play with, which is an ideological choice compared to, say, an Ancelotti. We have carries, passing variety, angles, switches, diags. We can go over the top, into midfield. We can battle, we can bait, everything. Arsenal could, theoretically, set up with the centre-back split and the goalie in the middle like this, or the goalie is the nominal second man and the other centre-back out wide pushing the full-back into the pivot like this. They could go with a 3-2 and a staggered pivot with either the midfielder joining and keeping the full-back wide like this, or the full-back joining and the midfielder staying high like this. They can form a deep diamond with Rice as a single pivot, or maybe even a jury and timber. 3-2, 4-2, 2-4, 3 diamond. We can basically do anything. You could do anything. There's so many options because we now have the players who can go inside and outside with less angle bias, receive, pass and play. And it's all crucially with quality. Kieran Tierney can go inside. Your mate at Sunday League can receive the ball. It doesn't mean it's with the same level of ability as we know we have now in the team. It's also the positional rotation within the setup. Say we're in a 3-2 with Timber out on the left, Saliba rested, and Jorginho and Erdegaard in the pivot as an example. Jorginho is more than capable of stepping in deep, especially centrally. If, say, we're finding we're not getting an opposition to jump enough effectively with those short passes inside to Jorginho before hitting the space, like we did effectively against Liverpool at home, for example, Jorginho could drop out the block, push a centre-back wide and dictate for a moment, maybe dragging a marker with him, and we can let Timber try and carry or be a little bit more aggressive from the inside probably controlling those inside duels in a different way than a Jorginho would. An option we didn't have for most of last year, freeing Jorginho to do his best work. Someone like a Declan Rice, I feel, will benefit from all of this as well. I don't love Rice having to drop too deep. He can do it, but getting Rice to dictate, I think, will come later in his career. At times last year, because of a lack of central access, especially towards the beginning of the season, I felt he had to come too short. And now, I hope, that's alleviated somewhat. But this is all slightly theoretical. Let's have a look at this in action. United have set up in a 4-2-4 type press quite a few times recently. They did it against City in the FA Cup final to great effect and did it again against us in our pre-season game. We didn't have our first choice 11 available, so struggled to deal with it. But let's imagine they do that against us again when we play them in the league. The space in a 4-2-4 press is obviously behind that first line where you can overload the pivot as they stay compact and narrow to stop progression to the dangerous middle. You're not going to overload that four or likely carry through them, so your best bet is to try and bypass it, although that's easier said than done. But with our best players fit, we can do that. Whereas in the preseason game, Hayne doesn't really have the passing reliability to do this, nor were the centre-backs really splitting that far, as I think they were worried about leaving him isolated. We can split Saliba and Gabriel further, both great wider at finding those passing angles, trust Raya more on the ball, and push White and Sayer Calafiori really high and wide again. 
Both are now available for clip balls out wide into the space that you can see is available when United do set up like this. You can theoretically bypass four players with one pass, especially if you manage to get the wide players in the four to remain narrow with some brave, deep, short passing between your three to bait them and stop that dual marking idea. If the fullbacks push on and stop that, great, your wingers are now free. If you don't have a goalkeeper who can play those balls reliably with quality, if you don't have centre-backs that you trust to pass deep and not lose the ball on the edge of the box, if you don't have full-backs that you believe can receive out wide and win those duels, then you can't do any of that. But we do. Another example, the draw against Chelsea at Stamford Bridge last year, where they set up with this three to stop us. We didn't quite get going, I felt, largely due to a double pivot of Jorginho and Zinchenko, who both wanted to step outside the block and dictate the game, meaning we reduced men further up the field. We felt stuck, like we had few options on the ball when deep, and our execution was off as it poured it down. Quite it's been raining. It's raining for both teams. <laughs> Could we have pulled both the fullbacks wide to stretch the middle and asked Erdegaard to drop and receive? Or drop Rice further back? Maybe, but we had those answers at the time. And now we have more. Now we might be able to access the centre more with a Calafiori on the carry instead of having to rely on the pass inside, which wasn't working. Again, Durian Timber could be up for the battle inside in the pivot. Calafiori's press baiting qualities might be trusted deeper and preferred to the left against Chelsea, with Saliba pushed wider, meaning White can step further up and can support Saka so we can hit him earlier. Mikel Marino can receive well in the left pocket and we might be able to find ourselves able to hit him through the lines. We've also found Havertz at centre forward since that game, so it could have gone long. And at that point, we hadn't quite seen Ben White inside either, nor had Raya fully settled. I'm not saying any of those are the perfect answer. Mikel, I'm sure, will have a better opinion on that than I will. And obviously, other teams get to do tactics too. The point is, I felt on the day, we had a real lack of options, a lack of way of changing that game. And now, I see us having a variety of high quality options to change the game. The diversity of profile and options also may go some way to solving the mid-block problem which we discussed in this video. It's likely Arsenal will settle on varieties within a theme. You can't change everything every week. I don't expect to see Saliba moving from central centre-back too much. I don't think Rice will be asked to play too much with his back to play, as I don't think that's where you get the best out of him. Players have limitations, and I'm not saying we're going to turn into this fluid relationism, yeah man, no one has a position type team. But again, sorry to hammer home the point, it's the tactical options that's the exciting part. And the importance of that can't be understated. Bayern can't do what they did to us. Potential Champions League semi-final. The opening half an hour against Chelsea doesn't play out like that, in my opinion. Two more points, we win the league. More control, more entries into the final third, less compromise on game plans. When you're as capable and as variable as we are going to be in build-up next season, with the impact that's going to have on chance creation, field tilt, attacking numbers, presence, mood, story of the game, moments. Maybe the millions are worth it. That said though, it is funny imagining the Arsenal board hearing Mikel's request for another defender. Not another one? I already can't wait for next season to make a part two of this to discuss what we do do rather than what we might do. For now though, let's enjoy the journey as we go through the gears and get ready for what could be the best season in over two decades. If you like The Different Knock, you can support us on Patreon monthly, or you can buy us a coffee.